Today's talk is called Mad Scientist Roadshow, um, and we'll explain why in a bit, but my name is Brian Olendyke. I'm BTO Pro on Twitter, Drupal.org, and everywhere else, and I've been in the community for like 12 years now. And uh, I'm Mike Potter, AMP on B.O. Um, I've been doing Drupal for uh, about seven years now, mainly as front end developer. So um, we get into weird stuff and why, right? Uh, and so why this talk? Um, so if you go to elmsln.org, you can find out more about the work that we, we do. Um, so we don't envision Drupal as like this thing that you use to build a, you know, a marketing website, if you will. We view it more as this organic platform that we're able to build out lots of different sites and lots of different configurations uh, to better meet the needs of education and educators. So whenever someone has a crazy idea, then out comes part of the snowflake. Right, and Drupal we think is really great at fragmenting from its base, but still being maintainable via things like features, um, Drush, and so as a result of that, we don't really build Drupal websites in the traditional sense. We more so use Drupal as almost an application development framework uh, to build a distributed learning network. And so what is Elms in a one slide elevator pitch? Anytime we get a new idea or a faculty member has a cool idea, we stuff that in a new domain. It's not really that different from Google if you think about the way that they do application rollouts, right? YouTube is a video service, goes in its own domain, right? But I can still log in with my Google account. Docs, Google Plus, all of these, right? So if we just kept deploying these new ideas and new functionality using a federated login system, we can keep expanding and innovating. And so in education speak, this is referred to as NGDLE or Next Generation Distributed Learning Ecosystem because we like acronyms for no reason. Um, but it's so that you end up forming, you know, kind of uh, patterns like this, right, where all these different pieces of functionality are stitched together via web services and single sign-on systems. So for the end user, it doesn't feel that way. And so our courses, because primarily we do this for education purposes, would be something like this, right? Hey, I'm learning about math. Um, but it's at a courses address, and we have kind of a course path there. That would be a Drupal site which we would then network together via RESTful web services with this other Drupal site, right? But a common look and feel, common usability patterns, common login, you don't know that you're skipping around if we get the UX patterns the right way. Uh, studio, as another example, a place where students in interact with each other, post images, it's a, a headless Angular app. And so this is all only possible because of the architecture and because of Drupal and the fact that we basically have a self-federated ecosystem. So all of our Drupal sites have knowledge of where all of our other Drupal sites are and faculty requesting new course spaces are kind of organically building this out, right? So why do you care? Because we get into really weird stuff as a result of all of those slides I just burned through really quickly there. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about today is some of that weird stuff that has emerged because of those requirements, because of just the architecture of Elms and the way at which we go about design. Um, so the first one of these little lightning talks in here is called Accessible Empathy. And so uh, the desired outcomes of this experiment, if you will, is to increase accessibility options uh, through user preference. And so if you, end users can select their own accessibility <laughs> options, uh, that we not only improve outcomes, but we also can help improve empathy. So if we not only allow people to check, oh, hey, change the contrast ratio, but we allow them to check, hey, uh, let me see what this site would look like if you had dyslexia. We can start to produce empathy with people that have different conditions as a result. So in looking through this and in through a lot of these, we had to get off the island, right? There isn't a Drupal module that does that. Um, and so one of the things we found in getting off the island through these needs was Open Dyslexic. Open Dyslexic is an open source font uh, created that manipulates all the fonts on your website to be more easily readable by people with dyslexia. So guess what? Now there's a module for that. So there's the A11Y module. Uh, if you get it, it gives you a lot of access to these plugins that we're gonna show here in a second. And so I have this little canned video. And I'll talk through what's going on. But the way we implement the A11Y module is you get this panel over here so you can make your interface bigger, smaller. You can do a high contrast mode, which uses CSS and JavaScript to tweak the contrast. You can invert the colors, right, which is better for people with certain ocular conditions. Uh, disable interface animations, which can help 
people uh, not get as disoriented. There's the, the open dyslexic font applied, which then is just check the box and it rewrites all the fonts to load that. Uh, then we get into simulations. So this is able to simulate every form of um, color blindness through SVG filtering. And so it's SVG filtering the entire interface. Uh, we can simulate field loss, which is something in the W3C spec to account for. And then if I refresh the page and I don't click the keyboard shortcuts button, simulating dyslexia. Now I've been told that this is not what dyslexia is like. Get it. <laughs> but this was a JavaScript simulator that just said, it was like, hey, my friend told me that he had dyslexia, and, and then all of a sudden the words start doing that. Um, so trying to create these ways in which we can get users to not only say like, yes, okay, I have to put alt tags, but actually empathize with the conditions of people that really need these things so it isn't just alt tag info. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this, you can find out at A11Y Project. There's going to be a lot of links throughout this entire thing because these slides will be posted later, so you don't need to furiously scribble. Um, A11Y module, uh, elmsln.org has blog posts as well as drupal.psu.edu has a lot of blog posts that we do through Penn State. Next one of these little talks is called Track All the Things. And so our desired outcome with Track All the Things uh, because people, we want to know what students are doing with our course material, right? Uh, kind of like Google Analytics type of stuff. Are you getting to these different goals? But for us, it could be, uh, are your students bothering to watch video? I don't know, you spent a month producing a really high quality lecture. It would be great to know if people actually bother to look at it. Um, so again, you didn't want to use a Drupal-based solution for this. Yes, there's stuff that can do tracking. You can just write PHP and JavaScript and do it. Um, but we found a platform called Learning Locker, which is a open source PHP, uh, it's called a Learning Record Store, or LRS. Um, and it uses a standard called Experience API. An Experience API, to unpack what that is, is basically that events are happening all the time everywhere. And so if you view the world as just emitting data at all times, like me moving my fingers is emitting data, that how would you track that activity statement? And so that you can track any activity boil it back to um, a verb, a person, where it happened, and what they did, kind of, you know, maybe some contextualized information, right? And so in this case, the verb is that I viewed something, I could mix in some extra context info, and that this is, you know, the agent is, hey, the admin did this type of a thing. It's a glorified JSON array. It's totally changing the training and education space, but it's a glorified JSON array. So, of course, there's a Drupal module for glorified JSON arrays. Uh, called the Tin Can API, which is an alternate name for Experience API. To, uh, it's like you know, a talk of its own. Um, you can actually go to experienceapi.com and then it'll say like, I say Tin Can, and you can click Tin Can and it just rewrites all the words to say Tin Can instead and goes to a different domain. But um, when implementing the Tin Can API, what we can do through Drupal is jump in at the point at which a message is about to be sent to our LRS and we can mix in our context data. So in this case, we're mixing in uh, a, a, the course a student is a part of and you know, what their role is, the fact that they're a student. Obviously, um, XAPI doesn't really have this connotation of what a course in Elms is. And so we can use the Drupal hook system in this case, mix that data in, sprinkle it along, and then it goes out the door. So to see what this ends up producing when you wire the world up for XAPI, is uh, we've actually got this public Elm site about XAPI. And so click around to things. We do this talk at some education events. We don't actually tell people, it's like, hey, you're learning about XAPI. But what's happening here is everything I'm doing is generating XAPI statements. And so then we unlock the visualization of that aspect later for people to see like, oh, that's what it means when I'm tracking everything going on. And so even down to the granular level of clicking these things and dropping them in that order, is tracked. And so then it's sent back to, this is uh, Learning Locker. And so then Learning Locker, you can unpack and here's the statements, right? So the fact that I clicked on that YouTube video, it monitored and sent a, hey, the user played from this point in the video to this point. This doesn't have to do with education. You can, a lot of people use Tin Can and XAPI for like analytics, for user tracking in any system. Um, if you wanna learn more about it, there's experienceapi.com or tincanapi.com, depending on which word you like to use. Uh, the Tin Can API module 
is out there, and then there's actually a little open course about XAPI if you want to learn more about it. So next talk here is I say flat file, you say CMS, flat file. CMS. Oh, there you go. Flat file. CMS. Yay! Audience engagement participation scores through the roof. So, track it. Track it. Yeah, XAPI for that. So, uh, what's the desired outcome of this? Well, we have faculty members who don't want to work with us. One of them who was supposed to be on this thing, he was going to give this talk so I can make fun of him. Um, but so, they want to not use Drupal. I can't imagine why. It's got such a great user experience, right? But um, part of it is just ownership of the material. The institution owns the deployment of the technology. And so if he's funneling all of his knowledge into that, it's in our database systems and not something that five years from now he's going to be like, oh, you know, where's that course file on my desktop? It doesn't exist. He shoveled all of his efforts into this third party thing. So uh, the solution that he, he came to and then we worked on a pathway to integrating is a tool called Gitbook. Gitbook is this pretty sweet little service that um, if you write books out in the open, they get published openly. And so um, it's all in Markdown. It's basically, it's, you know, which is flat file then, right? You just got lots of like hashtags and things. And then you can publish it out to GitHub. Well, then we went, okay, well, how do we get it from GitHub into Drupal now? Because I want to take all of this flat file static material and then put it into a dynamic system because that dynamic system is how we deliver it to our students. So in the process of getting off the island, uh, I found this library called just git.php, which seemed way too good to be true. I don't understand how it works, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. Um, because it doesn't involve EXEC or any security implications that typically would come with running a command line task in this way. But uh, it lets you have things like this where you say, hey, require git.php, and then you can just say like repo add, and that's gonna add everything that's on, in version control on the system, right? So it lets you, it gives you an interface between PHP and Git to easily run commands in Git, but from PHP. So now there's modules for this. There's a git PHP module, which is encapsulates the library, right? So you could use it for whatever. And then we wrote the git book module. And git book is different from the actual git book website. Uh, what the git book module does is it gives you the ability to in invoke a parser, which would be like, hey, you know, in this case, I'm parsing something called git book. But so that that way you could target a different data structure to import. Um, so for example, uh, is anyone familiar with read the docs? Okay, so read the docs is a documentation thing. You do your documentation in Markdown and then it publishes out to this nice little mini site. Um, there's a parser for it in the Gitbook module. So you could point a Drupal site at that and ingest the whole thing and turn it into nodes uh, in a Drupal book, which at that point you can do whatever you want with it. So showing this workflow that's laid out, uh, you know, someone not using Drupal at all, they, this is a Gitbook interface. And so this is what you end up getting, right? You've got this content outline. These are all marked down files. Very simple navigation. And then we want to go from that to GitHub. So links it up there. So now you can see the flat files that were generated and all these MD files, all right? So the folders help with the nesting to in imply like, okay, well, this is down hi hierarchically under here. Then on the Drupal side with the module, you get a content type called Gitbook. And so you plug in, just point at the repo, it ingests the repo onto the server, and then part uses the parser to run through and convert all of those into nodes. You, know, you can pick the branch or tag to use, and there's also some ex early work on two-way syncing, so that you could theoretically edit in Drupal and push back to a flat file system. And so now, this outline has entirely been built based on the work that's going on on GitHub. And then we've even got a little markdown <laughs> editor provided by um, an editor called Epic Editor. And so then you could just keep writing in Markdown in Drupal, save, have it rip back to the file system, and then sync it back over to the other side. This is just showing at the end, hey, that's on the, f the private files directory. This is the Git repo that we pulled in, in that case. So it's pretty cool workflow. I really like the workflows that that actually opens up. We've been talking about taking content that we have in Drupal and doing this to all of our courses so that we would funnel them out into flat file, even just as a, a backup mechanism, quite honestly, or version control, uh, beyond having to go through and do diffs, right, and use the <coughs> diff module to visualize everything, which is great, but still database-driven. 
Uh, so these are a bunch of links to that. Um, you know, every incarnation of git hyphen and git period and git. Okay. So um, last one of mine is uh, Jarvis make me a coffee. Has anyone seen me do this before? Okay, good. <laughs> Would ruin it otherwise. Okay, so the desired outcome is have a conversation using native browser technology. Has everyone seen Dries talk to Alexa before? Okay. I don't want people to have to own an Alexa to talk to something. Okay, that's the idea. Um, so let's make Drupal into Jarvis. So like that, All right? And so how would we go about doing this? Well, we need two different modes of communication. I need to talk to the browser and understand me and the browser needs to talk back to me. And so can I use .com to the rescue? There's the speech recognition API. It is actually in development for the browser as a way of brokering, okay, you can accept media input as someone talking and recorded text and then funnel it to whatever service you want. So obviously Google has one of these. Um, and then return confidence scores and things like that, right? So that you could build these types of Siri-esque interfaces in the browser. Um, and so, <coughs> This side of the spec is really obviously low priority for a lot of people. This demo only works in Chrome, unfortunately, on that side with the speech recognition um, and Opera because they're pretty much the same at this point. Um, Firefox, you can enable a flag to do it. But speech synthesis is actually really easy now. And so there's a lot higher browser coverage for that, for having the website talk. Because if you think just native operating systems already have a lot of that voiceover support built into them. It's really not a logical leap to then wire it into core browser tech. So again, getting off the island to the rescue, uh, there's a library called Anyang. And Anyang is this neat little wrapper on top of speech synthesis API that lets you just basically invoke like thing.speak and then type a word kind of a thing that you're listening for. And then if, if it matches that word, then it fires a JavaScript handler. And so there's a module for that, obviously. Um, there actually already was a module for this before I started exploring this. It was called Voice Commander. So then I just I made a 2x version of it um, that, that takes it a little further than it did before. But the way that you can then integrate with voice-based commands then is, so this uses hook voice command. and so. You see, I have kind of this array of the phrase that we're going to listen for. And phrase could be a, like almost a trigger word, kind of like Alexa or Siri or Hey Google, right? That trigger to invoke listening or paying attention. So you can, you can include one of those. And then anything in the brackets is, um, or parentheses rather, is uh, like optional, right? So if I said like, Hey Elms Play would be the equivalent of Hey Elms Play Video in that case. Um, and you can do other tokenized input like that. Um, then it's just tapping a JavaScript function on the other side. And so that you can see ripple.voicecommit.say and then whatever you want it to say. So that's the talk back to me. The other side is the, hey, whenever you match this word, I need you to invoke this. So wiring this up to a whole interface then. Scroll. <laughs> Next page. Next page. Previous page back, forward, hey Elms, anything I can do for you admin, open preferences, alternate formats, open speed reader, speed reader play, close, next page, scroll, Read to me. Since this week will likely involve a fair amount of waiting Stop. for people to... <laughs> Elms, what is lecture? From Wikipedia, call a new lecture. From the French, lecture, meaning reading process, is an oral presentation intended to present information or teach people Stop. about a particular subject. For example, by a university or college Stop. teacher. So that last part, specifically, there's a blog post for it, it says making, uh, making OK Google. That last part is then tapping into uh, another project called Puzzler, which taps into the Wikipedia web API. So then I have a trigger word for, hey, you know, define what is, right? What is is the key phrase it's listening for. 
I also, to, because the question would come up anyway, there is a way of putting this into continuous listening mode, which is how I'm not invoke, like, so you're just talking, right? It's also uh, affectionately known as letting the NSA listen in on literally everything you do on a web page. <laughs> so, yes, both, and yeah, we're aware of that. So normally you hit two keys to invoke that to happen, right? <laughs> as opposed to just letting it run all the time. But I do usually just let it run all the time because I'm really lazy. Um, but that last part is tapping Puzzler, and Puzzler is hitting the Wikipedia API, finding that word as the query, returning if there's any result, and then using speech to then say the thing at the end. Um, but the problem is that the, the name of this was make me a coffee. Make coffee. Why don't you get me a coffee? I do all the hard work anyway. I'll have a venti americano with six shots of espresso. It was a rough night last night processing all those rosters. So you can do, obviously, there's lots of Easter eggs in there. I'm not going to put one in for Konami code, because you know, saying up, up, down, down, left, right, that'd be a little extreme. But if you want to learn more about um, those technologies, that's the voice commander module and Anyang. And then there's the turn your site into Google Home, uh, which is wiring a whole bunch of different things together. It's a neat little case study. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Michael Potter. Yeah, I'll try to, try to follow that one up. So. Uh, <laughs> So, all right, so now the really cool stuff while you're all here, obviously. Um, so how many front-end developers out there? How many people implementing headless stuff, thinking about implementing headless stuff? So I'm going to take you through a little journey. Um, so as we said, we, we run Elms. It's an amazing system, self-federated system that talks to one another. Um, so naturally, what we do is we get these crazy ideas that come across our plate. And in the College of Science, we get a ton of crazy ideas. Um, but they're all good. They're, that's what we love. And you know, over the course of these ideas coming, with a, coming to us, um, I'm saying to Brian, you know, we should just make apps. Like, we're, we're taking Drupal to the absolute limit. Like, what these people have in mind are applications. So I think we need to start making applications that layer on top of Drupal. And so Brian said no, obviously. And then I begged him, and OK, he, uh, he conceded. Uh, so here are, here are our desired outcomes. So what we wanted to do was uh, change up the, the workflow a little bit. So we wanted to use a headless development workflow. So that's the big, that's the big word, the buzzword, right? Um, but it really is a really cool uh, workflow. It will really change your approach to developing web, a web applications. Um, so we knew that that's what we wanted to try out. Um, and the reason was, is obviously to create a better user, uh, uh, end user experience. So again, what these, what these people really want are Google products that are sitting in their courses. So made by one person, made by one person. the team <laughs> of one, right? All right. So, um, so what we decided to do was obviously we needed to get off the island a little bit and you know explore some some frameworks out there. Uh, we were pretty familiar with Angular JS, which uh, in layman's terms is Angular One. Um, don't say uh, Angular JS anymore to an Angular developer. It's a touchy subject. Um, so I, I did a lot of research and I really liked what Angular Two was doing. It's a very opinionated framework, and I think that to get ramped up. Um, going from not having done any of this to, to doing a full application, we needed some, some guidance there. So we picked Angular 2 and we went with it. Um, and you know, within a few, uh, few weeks, we had a, a pretty good working demo. So this was uh, an idea uh, to build on top of an existing um, uh, profile in our system, which is the Assignment Studio. So the instructor would have a place to go and easily create uh, projects, easily create assignments within those projects for their students. The students could go there and have a really slick interface to, to add blog posts and comment on each other's work and share files. Obviously, this brought in like state management issues, so went with Redux, which is uh, horrendously complicated, but works very well. Um, so this is what you get in, um, whenever we're talking about improving the debe developer experience. Uh, look how cool this is. I can then, you know, uh, upload my Redux file here and then I can fly through the, I can time travel back in time. 
and it's cool. So this is this gave us a really good win. We were easily able to to uh, to crank out this uh, this demo for the uh, for the instructor uh, pretty quickly. Everybody is really excited about it. We uh, we go and we implement a custom API because for headless applications you need a really good uh, API. So we spent uh, countless hours debating and designing and you know what format to go into. Um, but we got that all figured out. Uh, Angular has a really good C CLI, so naturally we started using that. It has Webpack, it does all your bundling and everything. Uh, tree shaking, which is a thing. Um, so then uh, naturally we learned TypeScript then um, to make everything a lot easier. Uh, so we learned that whole new language. Uh, uh, so this is our assignment and I see all of the properties and they're very well defined and my, my uh, my application knows exactly what's going on. I have a services file, so this is, this is where I'm telling Angular how to connect with Drupal. And it's in one place, so this is uh, assignments.service, so I, I know what to do there. So then we had to use Redux, which uh, Angular has a specific version for this. Uh, so this is NGRX, that is Redux built in, in Angular. Uh, it, gets, it gets better. Um, so you, you set up, you, you learn Redux, okay, and you set up your reducer, so this is assignments.reducer, okay, and then you create your reusable components, and this is the, this is the cool part, like, so these frameworks, you can create re reusable components, and you can build components on each other and reuse them, it's super awesome, so this is assignment-list.component.html, where every time I use assignment-list, it will render this template really easily, Naturally, since we're using Redux, I have to tell Redux, I have to tell my application that Redux notice the change, and it needs to tell Drupal um, because they need to be communicating, so naturally you do that through Redux effects, so that's assignments-effects, and you put all your effects in there. Uh, and then you compile it with the CLI. CLI is really nice, it takes care of all that. Uh, so you get a disk file, you get about 25 files, um, they're all minified and bundled and stuff like that. It's really slick. Um, and then you import that into Drupal. So you cre create a module and you loop through the disk directory, find all the files. You have to put them in the, in the right order. Um, but you in import the files and then you um, create your, oh, we have to add the, the app. That's right. <sighs> uh, so um, hook menu uh, at uh, CLI, you give it a path and then you put app dash root and then you reload the page and you have a application, Angular application running inside Drupal. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> you got all that, right? Yep. <sighs> so, um... <laughs> <laughs> so let's cover the pros of this approach. Can I see my water? <laughs> you, you can applaud too. I, <laughs> so we did that over the course of four months. So the pros, um, we can definitely create the app experience. Angular knows what it's doing. Um, it's built for that. Uh, it's, it's perfect. Uh, clear separation of concerns. Drupal as an API is a pretty cool uh, concept. It, it makes um, uh, keeping your, your logic separated so you don't have logic bleeding over into the front end and vice versa. Um, you can create the well-designed API that, that you're looking for since you had to spend that time. Um, and Angular 2 is really awesome. It, it, like, it's a lot to learn, but TypeScript is, is pretty useful. Um, the CLI is definitely very useful. So this workflow is obviously not ideal, right? Um, you have to maintain two different frameworks. Uh, Angular is a beast, and, uh, and it takes a long time to grok. So um, <coughs> Drupal is, is the same way. So uh, you, have to, you have to deal with that. Um, going mostly headless is difficult. So as you see, we had a, an application running inside of Drupal. Um, that brings a lot of workflow issues. Um, as you saw. Um, but going completely headless is also very difficult. So as soon as you um, start dealing with dynamic forms for the first time in your headless application, 
you're going to rethink everything. Uh, and you, so obviously you need to create uh, a new development workflow that fits what, uh, what you are trying to do. So what did we like? So we, we had a lot of lessons learned from this. So uh, separation of concerns, as I said, Drupal is an API, we really like that. Headless theming, oh, it's so awesome. It's really <laughs> cool. Uh, unidirectional data flow, whenever you get into component architecture, you'll pretty quickly figure this out, that managing state is ridiculously hard for some reason. Um, a component architecture, being able to reuse components and be able to design components specifically for one thing and knowing that they're going to be reused in other components. The documentation, so whatever, whatever uh, you choose, make sure that you can rely on documentation. Angular has really, really good documentation. Like I said, I got ramped up with Angular 2 in like three weeks. I was building the first prototype, which uh, with everything that has changed in Angular is pretty it's, it's pretty cool. So this is the end of the web as we knew it. This is the new design paradigm that we knew that we had to figure out how to do. So our desired outcomes for this. Uh, create a headless authoring environment, streamline theme workflows, make content modeling design first, eliminate as much Drupal theming as possible, Eliminate the theme from blocking upgrades, which was also very big for us. So in other words, save Drupal, right? The cliche. Yeah, but how? All right, so this is where you guys start cheering too. And inside, this is like, this is so happy. So we think that this is the solution. So uh, web components. How many people are familiar with web components? Awesome, cool. Um, uh, before I before I dive into web components, I, I want to sort of lay out some some groundwork here. So whenever I say web component, I'm not talking about Pattern Lab. I'm sort of talking about Pattern Lab, but I'm not talking about Pattern Lab, and, and I'll explain. So what Pattern Lab does is, first of all, Pattern Lab is amazing. It's awesome. If you're building in Pattern Lab, two thumbs up. Um, what it's doing is it's forcing you to build components the right way. So getting building components down to their absolute, uh, uh, what are they called, atoms? Yeah. Atoms? Oh, it's on the screen. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, well, it's like this tiny. Um, so, so the starting, the, the, the smallest point you design for that and you keep building, you keep building, you keep building <coughs> that, we think, I think that that's the perfect way of going about it. What Pattern Lab doesn't give you is it doesn't give you a predictable API. There's no API in that. It's, it's, you're, you're designing it the correct way, but these components aren't smart. They're, they're, just, they're just markup, right? <coughs> Web components is a spec. It's going to be a standard. It's already here. Um, so what web components are, are um, they're uh, a set of APIs um, that allow you to create new custom reusable encapsulated HTML tags in the use of web pages and web apps. Sounds like Pattern Lab, right? But the API is the key point. That's the key difference. So let's take an example. So awesome explosion. So let's say that you wanted to create this awesome explosion on your website. So if this were, if we were to construct this in web components, we'd want to use a new tag, like so like a div or a span. We wanted to create our own awesome dash explosion. Anywhere we use this, this explosion shows up. So now picture that we want to manipulate it a little bit. So we want to say, you can, you can change your size too. So you can say size tiny or size small. What if you wanted to change the color? What if you wanted to put HTML content inside of it? And really importantly, what if you wanted to notify um, your website that things were happening inside the component. So this is what we mean by an API. It will have, you can define properties on your components and you can emit events from your component. So a parent can communicate with a child through properties and a child can communicate with its parent through events. <coughs> and that's the unidirectional data flow that I was talking about. So the web component spec, it's made up of four things. Uh, templates, 
custom elements, shadow DOM, and HTML imports. So as you can see, Chrome and Opera, they've already implemented it. So you can, you can uh, use these without any polyfills right now today. Uh, so the, the rest of the, uh, of the vendors are still uh, working through it. They have, um, to my understanding, they have, they're all on board with this concept. They're still working through the minutia, like uh, HTML imports. Some of them aren't sure moving forward that that's the best move, so they're still discussing it. Um, but we can use web components right now. So there's a project called Polymer, and it's by the Google team. And the purpose of, this, of the Polymer project is to get people familiar with building websites with components, with uh, web components. So it's, it's polyfills to make sure it can run in every browser right now so you can use them today. Um, it adds things like lifecycle hooks to make them easier to work with um, and some syntactical sugar stuff built on top, sort of like how jQuery is to JavaScript, all right? So as an example of something that was just built, uh, the new Google Earth was just launched, built entirely with web components. So if you go there and check it out, right click on it and you'll see a whole bunch of web components in there. So let's walk through an example of what this might look like and, and how we can fit this into our workflow. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So in, uh, uh, in February, was anyone at uh, Drupal Camp New Jersey in February? I think. So um, during the sprint, um, we had talked about this concept. We, we, just, we were seeing how the <laughs> Angular app was getting and we were trying to come up with some alternatives. And we took a look at Polymer and we said, you know what, I think, we think this might work. Let's see if we can try to get um, some prototypes working. So within about three hours, Brian just wrote the module. So <laughs> thank you, Brian. <laughs> so uh, the web components module on D.O, and uh, the Web Components module is, is pretty slick. It does a couple things. So it tells Drupal how to import these, uh, these Web Components. But then what it also does is it reads the properties that you define on your Web Components, and it creates them as entities in Drupal, which should get everybody very happy. Right? Thank you, Brian, again. So um, let's look at an example. So this is our um, Drupal site, and we have an article. And this is uh, being rendered by a view. And right now it's just rendering the teaser view mode, I think. So how would we get this rendered through our web components? So first we would create uh, the elmzln-hero web component. You can really easily do this with Polymer. They have like a little tiny CLI that scaffolds a bunch of stuff for you. So inside of that one file, we had those four things that we talked about. We had the HTML imports, we had the template, we have the, um, the instantiation, the, the custom web component um, spec, and then we have some, uh, some scoped CSS. Um, and what that will give you is through the magic of Polymer and its CLI, it will take that file and it will create some documentation for you and some demos for you, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, this is just, this is just in one one folder. So what Polymer will do is it will create a folder for you. It will um, uh, create the mzln-hero um, file as well as some tests and uh, a demo file for you so that you can really easily communicate and share um, this web component. So the second thing that you do is you would turn on the web components module, obviously, that has a, a couple sub-modules. Um, like uh, uh, interacting with display suite and uh, polymer, um, as well as setting up some uh, display modes. So what I would do is, if I didn't want to touch the template files or anything, I just wanted to go, um, I just wanted to really easily wire up my article content type to my elmzln-hero web component. Um, just with the, in, the, in the interface, this is what I'd do. I'd go to manage display, you can see a bunch of view modes. Those are all um, web components. So these are the web components that it found in, um, that the web components module found in the web components directory. One of them is elmzln-hero. And if you notice, it automatically picked up on those properties that we defined in the HTML file. 
so, um, so it can read those properties. Since, we're, since it uses that really well-defined API, um, the Web Components API, it knows that we can read off properties. So what you do is for each one of those, you just, like you would um, any other site with uh, Display Suite, you just drag your fields into place. So the image goes into the image field and the title goes into the title field, et cetera. From there, um, like we said, we were displaying that article through views. You would just change the view mode to uh, Elms LN Hero and bam, there you go. So what we did was we completely bypassed the Drupal theme layer without coding or, or without doing anything in the templates or anything. It's, we just told Drupal, these are the properties, here's the fields you should send into those properties, the web component will handle, handle the rest. What do you think? Awesome. Pretty cool. <laughs> which, which method would you rather do, the Angular version or that version? <laughs> All right, so the uh, pros of this approach. Uh, separation of concerns, yep. Headless theming, absolutely. Unidirectional data flow, yep. Component ac architecture, of course. Documentation, of course. And the big one, this is, what, this is the game changer. Framework interoperability. <coughs> this component is currently being used, could potentially be used in all of these uh, frameworks at the same time. So if you wanted to um, update the Elms LN Hero across your entire um, uh, uh, portfolio, you could change it one time and it would update like that. Pretty cool. Um, so the cons of this approach. Um, obviously browser support. So if you are doing anything uh, under IE 11, it's not going to work. So you have to make that decision. So um, that brings us to what we were talking with uh, with uh, Save Drupal. So what are we saving Drupal from? So has anyone seen this? This is uh, Gutenberg, the Gutenberg demo from WordPress. Pretty slick, huh? Um, so this is like an in-place in editor. You can create different stuff. You can change the heading. You can push this wide and off to the side here. This is pretty cool. So it's just a demo, but um, this is what we're gonna have to compete against in the near future. So whatever you're selling uh, Drupal, your clients are gonna show you this and be like, well, can we do this? So can you? So, we, we definitely can. Uh, we think that if we, if we adopt web components and we um, learn from the other communities that are also contributing to web components outside of Drupal, we can all contribute together and come up with some really cool solutions. Um, we started uh, a Git repo called LRN Web Components for uh, their Stanford Learning uh, Web Components. Um, and what we did is, for these web components, what we said is they're gonna have um, a design and they're also going to know how to edit themselves. So let's take a look at the uh, panel card. So this is, this is just a card that you could throw on your website. Um, but what if this were inside the body of your website and you could hover over it and you could, let me <coughs> that up a little bit, you can hover over a little edit thing and you could in place edit that and you could change the color oh that looks good yeah uh, change the elevation oh that looks perfect I'll go ahead and hit save so this is what we have in mind so each of these would have their own edit state the Drupal website would only be in charge of putting these components into their edit state. Um, you would edit them. Whenever you click save, these components would, through events, notify Drupal, hey, I just updated, I need you to go ahead and update uh, the content that I'm on um, via RESTful Web Services. 
Uh, we can take a look at here's a uh, here's a block quote. So again, changing properties. I uh, like that outset. Yeah, that looks really good. Okay, uh, we can show like a little off-screen canvas thing. Yep, that looks really good. I'll go ahead and save that. So this, this is what we're thinking. I think we can build our, our Drupal sites, including these web components, so that we can start giving our users these really slick interfaces. LR and drawer, oh, the icon didn't show up. So Drupal doesn't, know, doesn't have to know about this. This can all be offloaded on the browser, which is really, really cool. So forget about like the plugin architecture of this one JavaScript library has to have a plugin for Drupal and for WordPress. And for, no. If it goes through web components, it will be interoperable. So let me pop back into my presentation. So here's some relevant links, webcomponents.org. It's a library of web components and open source developers and huge companies contributing their libraries to web components that you can use right now and we are using right now. Uh, Polymer Project is definitely, if you want to get started with web components, I highly recommend that. Uh, we have some posts on uh, drupal.org and uh, uh, drupal.psu.edu and elmsln.org about how, we might, how we're thinking about using those. And really important, I hope that if you're interested, please come to our BOF tomorrow because there's a lot of things to think about. There's a lot of um, uh, things to consider and talk through, and we definitely want to hear, hear your thoughts. So, and maybe build some web components. Cool. So that, that's what we have. Any questions? <laughs> that guy. That guy. Yes. Um, so great uh, presentation. Great job, both of you. Um, we saw at the end there a couple of components where the focus seemed to be on the editing process. Yes. Um, so I kind of a, OK, there's people behind me now. Two questions, actually. Um, have you looked into creating components that dealt directly with Drupal's uh, API first stuff? And uh, have you looked at more administrative side components? So we haven't actually hooked those edit states up to a back end of any kind yet, because um, we're just trying to focus on what would the UX patterns be if we had just a totally native experience for them. I would see the the plug in the hook up to Drupal being similar almost to the edit edit module from <clears throat> Drupal 7 land that got port that is in D8 core with the in place editing as far as you know find something put it in that quick edit mode make the change and hit those API endpoints or something like that um, what was the second question other administrative side components. oh administrate we haven't haven't really for example the settings pane mm -hmm. so that they're, they're adding in a Drupal 8. So no, we haven't looked into the into those. But I mean, but that's the application that works perfectly for this. I mean, they are. So uh, another thing that we didn't show, um, I had to add uh, last week before we were leaving. I had to add an administrative dashboard to that um, Angular app, and I tried to do it the Angular way, and it just wasn't going to happen. The <laughs> workflow is like I didn't want to touch it. So um, I I created a Polymer uh, component that. Retrieved the list of stuff, added some, uh, retrieved the list of submissions, added some settings and, and uh, some administrative uh, functionality. Um, and I implemented that in a few hours. And that, that I think if we can, the, the, the administrative panels in Drupal, I think it's perfect for. I just, I think it's way better than going with another framework, uh, another you know, large framework to, to solve that problem. I think it's perfect for that. I was just wondering, uh, do, do you have the uh, the web component uh, module ready for D8 already? 
So that was why I said, oh, yay, you talked to the microphone. <laughs> so he's been working on porting it to D8, which I ha have you used it yet in any regard? Or? Uh, no. Still, still need to still work on it. So, there's a D8. so we're sprinting on it. <laughs> yeah, okay. there's a D8 dev, dev branch for it. But yeah, I mean, Thanks. the idea is that then if it really all that that module is doing is bridging, is scanning it and bridging the entity, you know, skimming it off and turning it into entities as opposed to doing any real deep design integration is the, the goal. Yeah. Great job with your presentation. I just wanted to ask a question about the hero component. Was that a, a new field type or just like a template uh, for the image field type? Um, so the, the, the image specifically in the hero? Um, it was just an image field, and uh, the, I changed the formatter to output it as just the URL, because the web component itself was just looking for the image URL. Um, okay, so the hero component was just a formatter for for the image field for the image field type. So the the hero the what the web components module did was it recognized that we had a web component named hero, and it created a view mode for it. So within that view mode, um, it, we specified what fields should render through which properties in the web component. So if you so think of it like view modes. So each view mode is a um, web component. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I got one more. Sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Going back, Brian, to XAPI, and you gave the example of video. Um, yeah. How, how does the uh, video triggering actions to XAPI, are you using like a, the video player's JavaScript API, or how do you detect start, stop, pause, jump ahead? So there is a, I don't actually know if there's the tin can API underscore media, or video, I think they support media module natively, and so that then it's wired up to the player, to the HTML5 player, and it's listening for the HTML5 events if it's in place on the website. If it, in the, the example shown in that little demo, that's from YouTube, so then it's using the YouTube API, and basically um, the workflow is replicate, mirror the event, and then reroute it through a, um, through a like tin can submission type of a thing. The H5P module works that way as well, because the H5P module is list, it's going, I have an event, and then the tin can thing is like, I have something to do about that, but then what it does is it sends it back into Drupal via a system Ajax call, and then that callback sends it on the back end um, over to the LRS. So using that work, we've basically just been doing that with everything that we integrate it with. Um, that also starts to play into the web components side of things, because we could make, we're talking about making a like X hyphen API tag. Literally all it does is like, hey, property, verb. Hey, property, who did it, right? And if we pass that stuff in, now we start integrating XAPI even easier than it already is. It's already pretty easy to integrate XAPI. There's so many libraries for it, but. Yeah. Hey, um, where can we find the presentations or the, the material here? The, so almost all of these are, have blog posts of some form associated with them on either drupal.psu.edu mm -hmm. um, or EL, uh, this website the elmsln.org in the blog section. Um, the presentation as a whole, we have to, it's too big to upload to the, the website directly, but we will put it up there, probably putting, putting these on YouTube or something. So the presentation will be up there, yeah. And, it, and it's recorded too. Yeah, this is recorded. Right.